We are beginning a new series today called Royalty. Oops, I just lost my page. <clears throat> and uh, royalty, if you don't know, royalty is, it's a, well, I mean, everyone kind of knows what royalty is, but the definition of it is a people of royal blood or status. Um, a member of a royal family, the status or power of a king or queen, the most successful famous or highly regarded members of a particular group. So royalty doesn't necessarily have to be you were born into royalty, like you were, you were the son of a king and queen or lord or lady or whatever. But in our country, we have people that we kind of call American royalty, right? <clears throat> um, we have the Kennedys that we kind of were titled, you know, back in uh, John F. Kennedy's days, like... Uh, they were kind of our, our royalty in our country. So it's a highly regarded member of a particular group. And, you know, we're going to talk for the next couple of weeks about how we are royalty. I think we forget that or we don't really know that. But we are royalty when we are children of God. So our passage today is 1 Peter 2. We're going to read verses 4 through 10. So it's uh, page 857 in your pew Bible, if you want to grab that Bible in front of you and uh, read this along with me. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and the stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. And we thank you for who we are in you, Lord. Do a mighty work today. Speak to us wherever we're at and reveal to us who we are in you, Lord, that no longer would we be worried about the, the things of this world or what people think of us, but only what you think, Father. Help us to recognize that we are royalty, that we are worthy, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done. Help us believe this today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in our passage, it begins by saying that Jesus was rejected by humans. Jesus, he who was and is God, became nothing, rejected by man. But why was he rejected? Jesus was rejected by man because he didn't fit into their box. They expected a military leader who would bring them out from under Roman rule and reestablish the divinic um, kingdom. They expected someone who would come and bring them back to their former glory, or at least somebody who looked and acted and thought like they did. But Jesus was neither of those things. He didn't act and think and look like they did, and he wasn't a military leader. Therefore, they rejected him. Therefore, they hated him. And you see, oftentimes, we also reject Jesus because he doesn't fit into our box. Even if we don't know that we're rejecting him, we inadvertently reject him because we accept a Jesus that isn't a Jesus of the word of God. 
See, even professing Christians do this. Some Christians are appalled at a Jesus who would show grace and mercy to the less fortunate or to sinners. See, some people are so focused on following the rules, following the law, that that is that truth is all that matters. We have to believe truth. We have to live truth. And it's just truth with no grace. But that's legalism. And our Jesus was not legalistic. And then there's the other extreme of those Christians, who, people who call themselves Christians, who are appalled at a Jesus who would ever speak against someone for their choices or their actions or their sins. Our Jesus was a loving God. He would never judge me for my actions, is what is said. But this is a Jesus that is all grace. And when we're all grace without truth, we are permissive. And that is not the Jesus of the word of God either. You see, Jesus didn't fit either of those extremes. Jesus had a balance of grace and truth. So Jesus was rejected by the masses, but he was also rejected in a sense by the Father. This, I'm going to read this from a commentary. It's from Exalting Jesus in Luke. It says, In Luke 22, the Lord Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples. As he eats with his followers, two things are revealed. One, that he is the true Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And two, that Judas, Judas is going to betray him to his enemies. In verse 39, we read that uh, as they have finished that supper, the last supper, they've come, him and the disciples come out of the upper room where they've had their meal. And Jesus had this routine of going out to pray after that. So as usual, the passage says, Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On that faithful night, the Lord had a prayer on his mind. He instructs the disciples to pray as well. With the cross just hours away, you'd think that the Lord would ask them to pray for him, but he doesn't. He tells them to pray so that they may not fall into temptation. You see, the Lord is not the only one in danger that night. The disciples will face threats as well. At the center of this passage are Jesus' prayers He walked off by himself and he asked God, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now the other gospel writers, aside from Luke, they write it like this. They say that Jesus made petition three times that night. If you are willing, if you are willing, if you are willing, Take this cup from me. The time of prayer that Jesus was in was so strenuous that an angel from heaven had to come and strengthen Jesus. And yet in agony, he began to sweat great drops of blood. Take this cup from me, Jesus asked. Three times he says, take this cup from me. And yet the father is going to say, no. Now the cup that he's talking about here, it has two references. On the one hand, this cup refers to the cup of God's wrath. Now the Bible often symbolizes God's wrath as a cup full of strong, destructive drink, like wine that intoxicates and causes men to stumble. So the wrath of God will make men stagger in his judgment. In order to save sinners from their sin, the Lord Jesus had to drink or suffer that wrath in our place. The cup contains God's righteous fury against all the sins of the world for all time. Christ will suffer for all of it. 
Jesus knew that he had come into the world for this very hour and purpose, but this hour and purpose is so unimaginably, unimaginably stressful that even the Son of God asks three times that this cup be removed from him. Can you imagine being judged for every sin of every person who has ever lived? This is the cup of God's wrath. But it's also the cup of God's salvation. The bitter wrath results in our sweet rescue from condemnation, it says. In that agonizing scene of prayer, God the Father did something that has never happened between Father and Son. The Father rejected His Son. The Father rejected His plea. Though the Son of God prayed three times to have that cup removed each time, God the Father returns a silent no from heaven. No, no, no. Can you imagine watching your child in pain? I cannot imagine watching my child in pain. And if I could do something to help, to be able to say to them, no. And yet that is what the Father does. See, I struggle to watch my kids be in pain. And yet, for our sake, the Father said no. You see, the prayer that saved sinners was actually a prayer denied. The Father said no to Jesus in order to say yes to us. The Father said no to protecting and taking care of his son to say yes to us. So hear that again. The father said no to Jesus in order to say yes to us. We tend to think that God's plans are accomplished by his saying yes to us as if we know what needs to be done, as if we know the best way. And yet that's not the way it works. Here, with his only son, the father accomplished our salvation by saying no. Jesus had to drink the cup. Our greatest deliverance came from an unanswered prayer. So when you question God's no, remember that he knows better than we do. He is doing a greater work than we can ever imagine. And because God said no to that prayer, it led to our acceptance. Jesus was rejected so that you might be accepted. Later on in our passage, it said, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, individually, you must believe in him and live into this call. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we can answer the question, what am I called to be by recognizing that we are called to be what Paul says in, or Peter says in here, a holy priesthood. Or as he says later in the same verse, a royal priesthood. For those of us who know Christ, we have been called into this royal priesthood. We are accepted by God, but as Jesus was, we will be rejected by the world. The world does not like those who don't look the way they look. I got to tell you, my favorite people, my favorite people to talk to and to meet are those people who, don't, who know who they are and they just don't care what the world thinks. So the people who a lot of, a lot of people look at them and think they're odd. I love talking to these people because they, they don't care what the world thinks. It's this is who I am and this is how I'm going to live. And we had a funeral for um, Chuck um, Connolly the other day. And Chuck's cousin Patrick shared 
um, something that was, I, I just thought it was profound. It was one of the best parts of the funeral for me. And, and during that sharing time, getting to know a little bit about Charles, Chuck, um, Patrick said that Chuck had written to the Post Journal in response to an article. And this article, he said, was written on Valentine's Day. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you all the details because I don't remember all of it. It was a Valentine's Day article essentially on how to pick up girls. So, and uh, Chuck read that article and he was kind of appalled by the article. So he responded with his own letter to the Post Journal and said the advice this guy gives, and I think he said it was Mr. M is how they signed it, I think. He said that advice is terrible. He said that advice isn't about really picking up a girl. It's about manipulating someone into liking you. And he went on in his response to say, you know, if you like wearing a flannel shirt around your waist, wear a flannel shirt around your waist. If you like to dance, and I can't remember the word, word Patrick used, if you like to dance not well, maybe, <laughs> dance not well, but just dance. Do the things that you like to do. And the thing that struck me was at the end, Chuck wrote, when I date a girl, they will know who they are dating. There will be no doubt in my mind that they are dating me for me. Because there was no facade in Chuck. Everything that I heard Friday was that Chuck was who Chuck is. And there was no facade. See, as believers, we need to know who we are. And we need to live into that. You all know my weaknesses because I am not shy to share them when I'm up here. And even if I don't, you see them. You know my weaknesses. But that's okay. Because as much as I love you guys, I'm not here to impress you guys. I'm here because I'm following a higher call. And there's one opinion that I care about. How many of you have been accepted by God? You've surrendered your life to him. You've been accepted by him. And yet you haven't accepted yourself. I always assume that uh, one of the perks of being royalty, you know, if I am the king or, or the ruler of the land or whatever it is, that <clears throat> I don't have to care what anyone thinks of me. You know, that's why they walk with their heads up, because they're not looking down at the common people. They don't care what the common people think. They know who they are. And if you don't like me, then that's fine. Like the queen of hearts, off with their head. All right, maybe not that dramatic, but it's my land. You can move out. It doesn't matter what people think of them. See, I used to care so much about what people thought of me that I seldomly let people actually know the real me. There was always a facade. Lots of time there was always a beverage as well to help with the facade. But it wasn't me. When I surrendered my life to Jesus and I was filled with the Spirit, all of that changed. From one day to the next, I went from caring what everyone thought, and that was the only thing that was important to me, to not caring anymore what anyone thought of me. I, I've shared with you in the past that it was around Christmas time, so all of a sudden I'm crying at Hallmark commercials, and I don't care because this is who I am. Now, I'm not saying I don't care what people think of me in the sense of I don't want to be a jerk or anything like that. So, I, and I certainly don't want to act in a way that reflects poorly on my God. But as for who I am, that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, that I have experienced God, that I have heard that inner voice from God, which it's interesting, the other night, Friday, Thursday night after our parents meeting at the school, um, we went over to another parent's house and we met with all the, the parents of the kids that are in our class. So it was a little party at their house. And I'm talking to somebody I'd never met before and I don't know if they have faith or not. I, I'm going to assume that the answer to that was no. Um, but we're talking and I, he asked me a question. I bring up that I'm the pastor here and 
Um, he talks about writing sermons. And I said, yeah, I said, I basically, usually I pray and God eventually gives me what, I, what he has for me to say. And um, afterwards I thought, I'm telling this person that I don't really know, that I don't know if he's a believer or not, that yeah, I hear from God, he probably thinks I'm a nut. But then I thought, that's okay. Because this is the reality, this is the process, and I believe that God speaks, and it doesn't matter to me what people think. I no longer need to hide or care who I am. I only care what God thinks. You no longer need to hide who you are or care what the world thinks of you. You only need to be concerned about the opinion of God. My friends, if you are followers of Jesus Christ, then you are, as our passage says, a special possession. And in those wise words of J.R.R. Tolkien, you bow to no man. We don't need to bow to man. Man's opinion does not matter. The only opinion we need to be concerned about is the opinion of God. And once we figure that out and we can live into that, what is the purpose of all of it so that we can just feel better about ourselves, confident that our eternity will be secured in heaven because we said a prayer, because we asked him nicely? You see, Jesus didn't endure rejection, persecution, and crucifixion so that you could receive a get-out-of-hell-free card. Jesus was rejected so that we could become that chosen people, that royal priesthood. And this should make everybody just as giddy as it's making my daughter right now as she's cracking up here um, in front of me. You are a chosen people. Jesus was rejected so that we could become that royal priesthood. He suffered so that we could find peace in this life as well as the next. How many of you live as though you have that peace of God in you? I was talking with a member of our leadership team yesterday and they were sharing how they brought Christ to a person that was dying. And this person was afraid of dying and never really happy. And he, he was terminal, I think. I can't remember the whole story. I apologize. Um, but once this person surrendered their life to Christ, he said there was this change in him. Suddenly this person was no longer afraid of dying. He was no longer afraid of what was going to happen. He had this peace and this joy that, that couldn't even be described. You see, when we stop caring about what's going on in this world and we surrender all of it to Christ, we will have that peace and that joy and we need to be showing that to the world. This is what Christ came to bring. Salvation for this life and the next Peace and joy for this life. Peace and joy for eternity. We need to live into that as the body of Christ. Communally, we must begin to believe this and live into this call. And living into this call means that we work together to share the good news with a dying world that needs to hear it. Jesus was rejected and suffered so that we could be acceptable to God as this royal priesthood. And that through us, as, as our passage says, as God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. What are we as a church called to be? That royal priesthood. And what does that mean? If we are royalty, if we are children of God, it doesn't matter what the commons on this earth think of us. All that matters is what the heavenly Father thinks of us. And if we are priests, it means this. Alan Mosley wrote, every follower of Jesus is a priest in that we lead people to God and we speak to God about people. It used to be you needed a priest to send your messages to God. You couldn't go directly to God on your own. Today we can. And today we can also go to God about those who don't know him yet. 
we are still the one that brings people to God and we bring God to people. You are a royal priesthood and it is through you that the world may come to know Christ. So don't ever forget who you are. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a God's special possession. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and uh, I pray that you would help us to live into this reality, that we are not of this world, Father. We are your chosen people. And regardless of what the world thinks of us, Lord, you have a special purpose for us. Help us to live into that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we will um, meet the Father. We will meet Jesus in a very real way through the act of communion. And I do believe that every time we partake of communion, that the Spirit is here, that God shows up, that we meet him in the elements. So let's pray together the way we always pray. We will pray that God will reveal to us any areas that we may need to surrender over to him. And then I'll give you a moment just to spend alone with God and then we'll pray for forgiveness together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity to come before you to meet you during this sacrament. I pray, Father, that as we spend time with you, that you would speak to us, reveal to us the areas we need to surrender to you, Lord. We pray as the, the psalmist prayed, search us, O God, and know our hearts, test us, and know our anxious thoughts, see if there is any offensive way in us, and lead us in the path everlasting. Father God, we pray that you would forgive us for those areas that we haven't surrendered to you yet. We again pray with the psalmist, have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot, blot out our transgression, wash away all of our iniquity, and cleanse us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. This proves his love for us. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. During the Last Supper, oh, Jesus was eating with the disciples. In Luke, Luke 22, it says that, uh, oh, I'm going to lie to you, it's not Luke 22. Yes, it is Luke 22. In Luke 22, Jesus says, Jesus took the bread, broke it, gave thanks and broke it, giving it to his disciples saying, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Father God, we thank you for this uh, opportunity again. We thank you for this body and for this bread and this juice, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet, Lord, that one day we will all eat again with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.